This is a production of Cornell University. Hi, everyone. Welcome again to the 2023 HEMP webinar series. My name is Luis Monserrate, a second year PhD student in plant reading and genetics in Larry Smart Lab at Cornell University. I am accompanied by Cornell alum, uh, Tony Baracco, who has assisted me bring this webinar together, by also by um, Kim and Gemma, who have provided this digital platform for us to, to have our webinar series. And today we have a special guest, my advisor, Dr. Larry Smart, professor of plant breeding and genetics at Cornell University. And lastly, I just want to mention that this webinar is a component of a larger project, which is the development of educational modules that will be freely available on the Cornell HEMP website at the end of this webinar series. Each uh, module will consist of the recorded webinar, the instructional slide deck, and a couple of high impact papers pertinent to the respective subject. For instance, in this case, it would be HEMP diseases. Uh, all webinar recordings will be available on the Cornell SIPS YouTube channel if you're interested in rewatching them or sharing them with someone that could not attend. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Patrick McMillan. He is a PhD candidate at Cornell University in plant pathology in Chris Smart's lab. Unfortunately, Chris could not join us, could not join us today uh, due to the scheduling conflicts, which is why Patrick is presenting on her behalf. And his talk today is going to be on hemp diseases. So, Patrick, without any further ado, take it away. Thank you, Elise. And it's great to have everyone here today for this talk. So, um, like Louise said, I'm a third year PhD candidate here at Cornell University in Chris Smart's lab, um, where I study primarily um, pythium damping off on hemp and pythium root rots. Um, today, I'll be covering a bunch of different diseases that we see on hemp and um, showing characteristics of them and some of what you can do to manage these diseases if you observe them in your growing system. A lot of this work has been done by other collaborators in my lab, um, previous grad student Ali Kala, current student Jocelyn Schwartz, uh, Tex, Colin Day, Taylor Herman, and uh, Chris Smart, my advisor. So I know for the, um, the posting for this talk, we made the disclaimer that we aren't going to be um, focusing on hoplite and viroid, um, which is becoming an increasingly uh, prevalent issue across the country. However, we haven't yet seen this in New York State. So um, we're not re researching this here, but I did just want to mention a couple things um, about hoplite and viroid um, here right at the beginning. So on the left here is just a healthy plant that was not infected with hoplite and viroid, it was mock inoculated. Um, here on the right is one that is infected with hoplite and viroid. And you can see that this infected plant shows smaller fan leaves and a leaf epinasticity um, in the plants infected with this viroid. So while this is seen in some parts of the country, but not here, um, there is work going on in some other labs. Um, and there's some great publications in the viruses journal. So first, I'd just like to give a general overview of what I'll be covering through the remainder of this talk. Um, so I'll begin with a very brief pathogen concepts overview um, to just preview the types of things I'll be talking about. Um, then I'll move into examples of bacterial diseases, followed by fungal diseases, which are our most common diseases on hemp, um, water molds or oomycete pathogens, and then I'd like to share some research results from uh, experiments that were conducted here at Cornell, including my own research on lithium damping off. So what do you need to know to reduce hemp diseases in your growing system? Well, first it's important to think about what uh, types of things that a pathogen needs in order to infect a plant. So plant pathologists often like to think of this concept in something that we refer to as the disease triangle. There we go. So in order for disease to occur, there's three components that are essential. You need a susceptible host cultivar. So a cultivar of hemp that's susceptible to whatever particular pathogen. You need that pathogen to be present and you need a virulent strain of it. There's a virulent strains of uh, pathogens around that might not infect, even if it is a susceptible host cultivar. And then finally, you need a favorable, favorable environment. 
So pathogens often require certain um, conditions, whether that's uh, moisture content or temperature, in order for them to successfully infect a plant. So without all three of those components coming together, you won't see disease occurring. Um, so then moving on, uh, things that you should be considering when you want to develop management plans for your particular growing system. It's important to know what pathogens are common on your farm or in your area. Um, what have other neighboring growers seen in recent years or what have you seen year to year? Uh, keeping some sort of record of that can be very helpful. Knowing the rotation of the, the rotation history of the field you're planting in can be important. Um, some pathogens can uh, survive on multiple hosts, whereas others have a very limited host range. So knowing what pathogens have been there and how they overwinter is important to management as well. Um, like I mentioned just before, environmental conditions are very important for diseases to occur. Um, so knowing what pathogens are in your area and as well as what types of environment you normally see um, all contribute to this. And that becomes a little bit more difficult as we see a uh, greater variability in the climate season to season right now. So then when we're considering managing the pathogens that we do have, cultural practices are often our best bet at reducing pathogen pressure. So things like avoidance, uh, not avoiding the pathogen itself, not planting in very wet areas, um, pruning, those sorts of things that we'll discuss more in detail in the coming slides. And then finally, uh, chemical control is our last fallback. So what products can we use to control diseases that you expect to see in your field? And is there any efficacy data supporting um, the efficacy of products registered for hemp diseases common in your area? Now, it's important to know that there aren't uh, as many registered pesticides um, available for hemp as in other crops. However, this number is growing. And it's always just important to make sure you read the pesticide product label and follow all instructions for your location. So the first group of pathogens I would like to talk about are diseases caused by bacterial pathogens. Um, one that we've seen here in New York um, recently is serratia marcescens, which causes this necrosis on the leaf tissue and wilt and senescence of the leaf. When we plate this out, we often see these white to pinkish colonies growing in culture. Serratia marcescens is usually seen early in the season and it thrives mostly in cool, wet years. Um, so as the summer progresses and it warms up a little bit, uh, we usually see less of this disease. Um, as, the, as the disease progresses and this necrotic area moves across the leaf, spreads across the leaf tissue, the leaf will eventually uh, senesce and fall off. After losing some of these infected leaves, the plant is often able to grow out of um, this disease and shouldn't really become too much of an issue unless the environment is very favorable for uh, this disease in a particular year. There's also a number of bacterial leaf spots that have been observed. Um, there's several different species of bacteria that can cause uh, leaf spots, such as these, where you see black lesions on the leaf surface. Um, some of the bacterial species, such as Pseudomonas cannabina, can cause disease on other crop plants as well. While we have observed um, some of these leaf spots, they're not terribly common in this area of New York. So bacterial pathogens have yet to be well characterized in hemp um, and understand their biology and epidemiology in order to inform management strategies. They haven't become uh, kind of the overarching prevalent disease group uh, that infects hemp. Fungal pathogens, however, are much more common and there's a wide array of them that are very problematic to growers. One of the most common um, fungal leaf spots in hemp is septoria leaf spot. It's caused by the fungus Septoria cannabis. Um, they form these lesions on the leaves that have a brown necrotic center followed by a yellow halo. Um, eventually, these lesions will coalesce and lead to defoliation of the leaves. The spores are spread via wind and splashing of rain 
And this pathogen can overwinter in the soil. So this is where knowing uh, your previous uh, crop rotation in your fields is important. Removing leaves or branches near the base of the plant and uh, thinning the plant to increase airflow will help reduce the disease. And here is just an image of someone pruning off some dense foliage in order to increase airflow in the plant. So here's a more up close image of the Septoria leaf spot. I'm seeing this lesion with the characteristic dark brown or black dots in the center of it. Um, here in those uh, darkened areas are where the fungal spores are contained. And these are released from these structures during periods of leaf wetness. So the wetness is really important in order for this pathogen to spread um, onto neighboring leaves and neighboring plants. Currently, a student in our lab is uh, working on screening some uh, sessions of hemp, about 75 different cultivars for resistance to septoria leaf spot um, to look for any kind of genet genetic resistance that can inform breeders um, to incorporate into their cultivars. And we're also testing biofungicides for efficacy to control this pathogen as well. So hopefully we'll have more um, exciting news in the coming years on how to control this very common leaf spot. Another common leaf spot that is observed is bipolaris leaf spot caused by the fungus Crescularia gigantia. Now that might seem a little bit confusing with the nomenclature here, but fungal taxonomy is always changing. So the names um, don't necessarily line up, but this is often commonly referred to as bipolaris leaf spot. The lesions here on the leaves that you uh, see from bipolaris are much smaller than those of um, serratia or septoria, sorry. Um, and they usually have this yellow color um, compared to other leaf spots, which are darker. These can infect other plants, including weed species as well. Um, so in so, uh, scenarios like this, weed control is very important um, because you don't want a dense coverage of weeds that can harbor pathogens and infect your crop. Like many other fungal pathogens, bipolaris is favored by wet weather. And then another leaf spot, Pristularia, uh, is um, very common uh, under certain climate conditions. We saw a lot of this in 2021 here in New York. It forms these very distinct target-shaped lesions with concentric circles. Um, so it's pretty easy to distinguish from the others that we talked about. Like the other leaf spots, it can cause defoliation um, when it progresses far enough. This does have other hosts, including maple trees. So you might see this um, if you're growing close to a wooded area. Um, however, very little is known about the impact of the pathogen on hemp yet, um, as far as yield reductions or um, how prevalent it is really. We've just observed this um, a number of times in the region. So another um, interesting foliar pathogen of hemp is hemp rust. Now, rusts are very important um, and need to be controlled heavily on uh, grain crops like wheat. Um, wheat rust is a very problematic issue. On hemp, um, it often isn't as severe, where it forms these pustules on the underside of leaves and can cause defoliation um, and yield reductions in very severe outbreaks. Um, but typically, you're only seeing small amounts of it. The, uh, the causal species of hemp rust is Eurido uh, krigeriana. It forms orange colored spores on the underside of the leaves that uh, form these larger pustules. Once it's on the leaf, it can uh, spread throughout this leaf tissue and the spores are wind blown to other neighboring leaves and plants. Uh, little is known about the pathogen life cycle of this particular species on hemp right now. Some rusts have alternative hosts that they need a second uh, plant species to complete its life cycle on. Uh, this species just has not been studied enough yet for us to know those details. And like I mentioned, it's not most the, or among the most common pathogens that we see here in New York, but we have found it a couple times. A pathogen that is very common and infects the flower buds of the plant, the inflorescence, is gray mold. Uh, 
caused by botrytis scenario. So when botrytis first infects, you'll see this characteristic gray mold where it gets its name from, covering the inflorescence of the plant, um, which will eventually turn into brown necrotic tissue, making this flower bud totally unmarketable. Um, so this can be very problematic for growers, uh, particularly in very humid climates, or this can be seen a lot in controlled environment agriculture, anywhere where, where there's a lot of moisture. Um, we see this more in cultivars with very tight floral development. Um, so anywhere where it can trap in a lot of moisture and prevent uh, increased airflow will be a perfect environment for botrytis to develop. And you'll see greater fungal sporulation in rain or higher humidity. This pathogen shouldn't be confused with fusarium head blight, which is a similar uh, inflorescence infecting pathogen. So fusarium head blight and bud blight is caused by several species of fusarium. Um, these fungi can produce dangerous mycotoxins in cereals and other grains. Um, and the species that do infect hemp are known to cause these mycotoxins. However, it hasn't been studied yet whether mycotoxins are produced on uh, hemp inflorescences yet. There's currently some wonderful research being done on fusarium head blight by Nicole Gauthier's lab down in the University of Kentucky. Um, so for more information on fusarium bud blight, I would strongly recommend looking at some of her work and her lab's work. Um, it's very important to be aware of potential mycotoxin uh, form, uh, mycotoxins forming uh, because these are very dangerous um, to any livestock that you might be marketing grain for or in other uh, food products. We don't really know how common this is yet in New York. We haven't conducted much popu many population biology studies um, or study the epidemiology of this. As you're probably getting the gist of with a lot of these pathogens, we're just beginning to study a lot of them. Um, one more pathogen that infects the inflorescence and well, essentially the whole uh, above ground portion of hemp is white mold. White mold has a very, very broad host range. So crop rotation probably isn't going to help you in this instance. Um, it can infect many different crops. It's caused by the fungus sclerotinia sclerodiorum. White mold infects the stem of the plant um, where it can clog the veins of the plant that prevent water flow from reaching the upper shoots of the plant. So as it cuts off the water flow from the upper shoots, you'll see the plant start to die from the top down. And you'll also see this characteristic white mycelial growth over the stem of the plant. If you break open the stem, you'll often find these hard black uh, pieces that are part of the fungus itself. They're the sclerotia or the hardy overwintering spores of this fungus. So those will fall down to the soil and allow this uh, this pathogen to overwinter and survive year to year. So moving on from foliar and floral pathogens, um, I'd like to move to some root and crown infecting diseases. So while I mentioned just before that there's some species of fusarium that infect the bud of the plant, there's also species that infect the crown and roots of hemp. Um, some of these species include Fusarium oxysperum, Selenae, and Proliferatum. <clears throat> We've seen a lot of this uh, across uh, grower fields in New York and in some of our own field trials. Um, this is often observed by a browning and wilting of the shoots of the plant and total plant collapse eventually. If you dig up the plant, you'll see some reddening and browning on the roots and overall uh, reduced root biomass. Um, so similar to what I discussed about white mold blocking off the water flow of the plant, fusarium will do this also, but starting at a much lower point in the plant. So it will infect the veins or the roots and block off the water flow through the veins um, and causing wilting and eventual plant collapse. This is most often seen when you have very small root development. Um, so if there's if there's weak roots going into your field in the beginning of the season, 
you might be, your plants might be more susceptible to some of these root rots. A similar pathogen um, that causes root rot and plant collapse are pythium root rots. Um, it's important to note that pythium isn't a true fungus, it's an oomyce or a water mold, which I'll discuss more coming up. Um, root rot in larger plants can be observed in the field like this here. Um, in smaller seedling production, you can often see damping off caused by the same species of pythium, uh, which I'll discuss later on. And uh, root-bound transplants can be very weak, like I showed in the previous slide where you have small root development going into the field. Those plants will often be weak and more susceptible to pythium and your other root rots. It's also possible to have co-infection with some of these pathogens, or a lot of these pathogens, actually. Um, so from this plant, we were able to isolate both Pythium and Fusarium, both contributing to the death of this plant. Some management strategies I'd recommend for root rots. Um, well, first, we would always rely on some genetic resistance of host cultivars, um, which we don't really have available to us at this time. I'm sure we will in the future, but right now, uh, there's not great host resistance known. So we heavily rely on uh, good sanitation practices. Um, so don't move soil between fields, clean your farming equipment well, ensure adequate drainage in the field as these pathogens usually really like uh, saturated soil and wet areas. Uh, crop rotation might help. These, uh, these pathogens often have wide host ranges, but depending on what you're planting, it might work. Um, labeled fungicides with substantial efficacy data are limited, like for most of the other pathogens on hemp, um, but there are some options available. Just uh, refer to product labels and uh, resources from your local extension agents. And as I mentioned several times, be sure to have a healthy root system at planting. That's kind of your best way to ensure success uh, going on. Um, there are some products that can control fusarium. I uh, hear this was a lab uh, in vitro assay showing that copper can inhibit fusarium growth, at least in culture in the lab. So here on the right um, are fusarium colonies on uh, media with no copper added. And then as we move across to the left, there's increasing concentrations of copper. So where you see this smaller circle in the center that uh, shows that there's smaller fungal growth uh, suppressed by the copper. So there are some uh, potential uh, treatment management strategies for these pathogens. I'd now like to move on to diseases caused by water molds or oomycetes. Um, so one that we've seen several years in a row here in New York is hemp downy mildew. If you grow other crops, you might've heard of downy mildew um, in cucurbits or um, other crops that you might grow. Here in hemp, it's caused by the species Pseudo Pseudoparanospora cannabina. We first observed it here in New York in 2020. Um, and this species is most closely related to cucurbit and hop downy mildews. It only survives on plant tissue. It's an obligate biotrope, meaning that the uh, pathogen itself needs living plant tissue to survive on. And the spores can spread via the wind. We don't know if it's seed transmitted. Some species of downy mildews are. Um, we just don't know enough about this yet. And like a lot of our other diseases, it thrives in cool, wet conditions. And then we did see this again in 2021 in New York and also Massachusetts. Uh, so the symptoms of hemp downy mildew, it first infects the underside of the leaf tissue, and you'll see this gray sporulation on the underside, uh, hence the name downy on the down underside of the leaf. Eventually, it will uh, move to the upper surface. It kind of travels directly through the leaf. So by the time that you see these lesions on the upper surface of the leaf, the underside is probably heavily colonized. Hemp downy mildew. Um, produces sporangia, which are the asexual spores. These spores can move through uh, water and the wind to germinate on other leaves. And then it does have these overwintering O spores um, that can survive on leaf litter in the soil and cause the disease year to year. 
our lab is currently working on some uh, research projects studying hemp downy mildew. Um, someone is screening germplasm for resistance to hemp downy mildew. We're collecting isolates across the region to study pathogen diversity um, and how diverse this pathogen is, um, as well as looking for control strategies, which is our ultimate goal for all of our disease research. Um, things that you can do to prevent hemp downy mildew are reducing leaf wetness by pruning, removing leaves, and increasing airflow. So for the last portion of this talk, I'd like to focus on research results from our own lab. Um, I'll focus on two projects here, one uh, on powdery mildew completed by Ali Kala, who recently graduated, and my own work on pipium damping. So powdery mildew is a very common um, fungal pathogen of hemp that you often see in uh, greenhouses, controlled environment agriculture, as well as in the field. It's caused by the fungal species Golovinomyces ambrosiae, and powdery mildew, as the name suggests, forms this white powdery mildew across the top of the leaf surface. If you zoom in closer, you'll see these long chains of spores that under the microscope are actually all of these asexual spores that stack on top of each other. These spores are then wind dispersed and easily move from plant to plant. So if you're moving between planting areas, you can easily take this with you. And uh, like downy mildew, uh, powdery mildew also needs living plant tissue to survive. I should mention that this is primarily found on the upper surface of the plant, um, but can really infect all above ground parts of the plant. Um, you can see it colonize the flowers sometimes, but you'll usually first observe it on the upper surface of the leaves. Powdery mildew prefers hot, humid conditions, but dry leaves. Um, so unlike some pathogens that require leaf wetness in order to disperse, uh, powdery mildew spores, the asexual spores, will burst um, when they encounter water. So it likes high humidity, but a dry leaf surface, which makes greenhouses a really great spot for powdery mildew outbreaks to occur. Um, our lab has conducted some fungicide efficacy trials where the goal was to compare the efficacy of some products currently labeled in New York State for use on hemp to control hemp powdery mildew. And we also wanted to know whether powdery mildew infection itself or, excuse me, or a fungicide treatment would affect cannabinoid production in hemp flowers. So we didn't know prior to this if diseases themselves can alter cannabinoid production, and this can vary between different diseases, or whether these products we are applying might impact cannabinoid production as well. So the products uh, tested in this trial included two biological products, Lifeguard and Double Nickel, um, Sil Matrix, a potassium silicate product, as well as a treatment alternating between Lifeguard and Double Nickel. We used isoxystrobin as a conventional uh, positive control. However, that's not currently labeled for hemp. Uh, we were just able to use it in a research context. And then we compared all this to our non tria controls, of course. So these um, studies were carried out in 2020 and 2021. Um, since it's a, an obligate biotrope, we had to grow the inoculum on living plants in uh, growth chambers. We then washed off the spores from leaves of those plants and spray inoculated plant tissue in the field. Uh, plants were inoculated three different times in order to ensure infection. Um, and then the disease severity was rated five times once a week where the percent disease coverage was quantified. And this allowed us to calculate what we refer to as AUDPC or the area under the disease progress curve. So that's essentially a measurement of how the, how the disease progresses over the course of a growing season. And the greater the value, the greater the disease is. Um, at the end of this growing season, we collected <clears throat> mature inflorescences for cannabinoid analysis. Here, this graph is showing the data from 2020, where we used the cultivar TJ's CBD, high CBD variety, 
Um, on the x-axis are the different uh, fungicide treatments. And then on the y-axis is our disease severity rating, the AUDPC. The greater the value on the y-axis indicates a greater disease severity. So we can see that our untreated controls had the greatest uh, average disease severity. And then all of our um, fungicide treatments did decrease disease severity, at least numerically. Anything sharing a letter above it um, represents statistically indistinguishable um, treatments, whereas those with different letters are statistically different, significantly different. So cell matrix, our alternating treatment, double nickel and azoxystrobin, all significantly decreased uh, the disease present um, of powdery mildew. This was repeated in 2021, however, using a different cultivar white CBG, which in the year in between these two uh, trials, we noticed was more susceptible to powdery mildew. So we wanted to see how do these products perform when disease pressure might be even greater. And again, we saw the same thing where untreated control had the highest level of powdery mildew infection, and then our fungicide treatments all seem to be pretty effective. Lifeguard alone was not statistically um, significantly different from the untreated control. However, if you alternated lifeguard and double nickel or use double nickel or soul matrix um, alone, you saw pretty good disease coverage. And this combined treatment might indicate that double nickel itself is really pulling most of the weight here and is a very effective fungicide to use. When um, we looked at the um, potential cannabinoid content of our uh, different treatments, of the hemp and the different treatments, um, similar graph where we have the treatments on the x-axis, uh, here on the y we have total potential CBD. Um, while there are, this seems to be a bit of a gradient, the Y scale here is actually pretty narrow. So there were no significant differences between any of the treatments um, in any of the cannabinoids measured. So we quantified CBD, THC, CBG, and CBC content. And like I said, there were no significant differences um, in cannabinoid content in any of the fungicide treatments in either our 2020 or 2021 trials. So that's good. Um, you shouldn't be having to think about fungicides you're applying. Um, to know whether they might impact what your harvest yields are. Likewise, when we looked at plants that were just infected with powdery mildew, we saw no significant differences between those infected with powdery mildew or those that were non-inoculated. Um, um, and this was true in both, in all of the cannabinoids measured, THC, CBD, CBG, and CBC. So the pathogen infection itself wasn't um, impacting the cannabinoid content as well. So some conclusions and takeaways from this fungicide efficacy work are that some of the products that are available for growers to use now are effective in reducing powdery mildew disease pressure. Um, the two in our study here that worked quite well were uh, still matrix and double nickel, but there, I'm sure there's other options available. The fungicide treatments used in, in this experiment did not impact cannabinoid production in hemp. And likewise, powdery mildew infection also did not affect um, cannabinoid production. So another component of the powdery mildew work completed was to identify if there's any host resistance to powdery mildew in hemp. So here we uh, surveyed a broad uh, genetic diversity of hemp of 30 cultivars. Um, and there were two sites of this in two different on both of our campuses here in New York and Geneva and Ithaca. Um, so here each graph represents one of the growing locations. So here was our research field in Geneva and on the right is our research field in Ithaca. And as you can see, um, so on the y-axis is the mean percent of diseases per plant. So essentially disease severity. Um, and there's a very wide range of disease severity across our different cultivars. Some of them having uh, practically no disease, while others are very heavily uh, colonized with powdery mildew. So this information is very useful for plant breeders um, to identify genes of interest that might control uh, disease resistance that can be incorporated into future breeding lines. <clears throat> 
So in these field trials, um, we've identified at least one potential source of host resistance, which is currently being used in the Cornell breeding program to breed for uh, genetic resistance to powdery mildew in hemp. We're continuing to screen for additional genotypes uh, to allow us to identify other sources of genetic resistance. And this information will also go to the breeding program. Learning more about the pathogen itself is critical. Um, we don't really know how the pathogen overwinters or if it sexually reproduces. Um, knowing more about the biology can allow us to better inform our management strategies. We've tested several products for powdery mildew control and all have been effective if they are applied prior to the arrival of the pathogen. This is really important. If you're trying to apply a fungicide after you already see infection, it's often too late. That's not always the case, but it's fairly common, especially when you're using biofungicides. They need to be applied very early in the season um, and uh, prior to infection. <clears throat> um, we were also interested in determining what the host range of hemp powdery mildew is. So other powdery mildews, uh, there's powdery mildews found on many, many different plant species. Others often have uh, very narrow host ranges, but there were reports of the species that infects hemp, Colobinomyces ambrosiae, um, infecting some other uh, plant species, uh, such as sunflowers, okra, and zinnia. And similarly, well, interestingly, there have been reports of a cucurbit powdery mildew species on hemp. So we want to test uh, how true this is, how far it extends. Um, so in this field trial in 2021, 22 different cultivars of plants were inoculated with Golovinomyces ambrosiae, the hemp powdery mildew pathogen. And these included cucurbits, zinnia, okra, and sunflowers. Um, like our other fungicide trials, they were rated for disease severity, this time five times throughout the growing season and our AUDPC or disease severity was calculated over the course of that growing season. We then collected powdery mildew DNA um, to identify the species causing the infection. So we want to see if what we were inoculating the plants with was indeed what we were uh, seeing at the end of the growing season when infection was heavy um, or if something else was moving in naturally. So uh, some of the summary data from these experiments showed that yes, all of these different uh, plant species are susceptible to hemp powdery mildew. However, we saw great differences between cultivars uh, within these crops. So for example, here on the left in okra, uh, one species was much more susceptible than the other. And this was seen in all of the different uh, crops that were tested. So while they might be susceptible, um, there could be great variation depending on what cultivars you're using. Some of the important takeaways from our host range trial were that hemp powdery mildew caused by Golovinomyces ambrosiae has relatively wide host range, including okra, sunflower, hemp, uh, sun hemp, zinnia, and some cucurbits. While cucurbits can be a host of Golovinomyces ambrosiae, the hemp powdery mildew, um, another powdery mildew species, Podophspora xanthii, uh, was collected from more of the cucurbits than we collected the hemp powdery mildew from. So this Podophspora species is the powdery mildew that is primarily seen on cucurbits. And this is what we were um, isolating back out from cucurbits that were infected with powdery mildew. So this, this is showing that um, this pathogen spread in naturally and uh, most likely outcompeted the uh, species that we were inoculating with. There's differences in susceptibility to Golovinomyces ambrosiae among our different cultivars. Um, so this is important information um, to think about what you're planting next to each other. If you have hemp and you're concerned about powdery mildew, you might not want to plant some cultivars of sunflowers, for example, that are very susceptible um, and can bring in more powdery mildew. Um, and then finally, I'd like to move on to my own dissertation work on Pythium damping off. So 
uh, like I mentioned previously um, with Pythium, it's an OMIC pathogen here on the bottom left. Um, these are two healthy seedlings with quite long roots. And then these top two were inoculated with Pythium muriatala. And as you can see, they really did not get very far before the plant fully died and did not develop uh, extensive roots. Here is just a healthy flat of hemp seedlings growing compared to those inoculated with Pythium. So this pathogen is really capable of completely wiping out uh, seedlings. This is often seen in greenhouse production where you have small plants growing. So maybe if you're growing um, hemp baby greens, uh, this is a pathogen that you might be more concerned about where there's high moisture content and young, very susceptible plants. Um, so while Pythium damping off can be caused by many different species of Pythium, uh, one that I focused on was Pythium muriatilum. It was first reported on hemp in Connecticut in 2018. Symptoms include wilting of the leaves, necrotic lesions on the root, roots, and then uh, the outer cortex of the roots will slough off from the inner uh, uh, vasculature of the root system. And if this progresses long enough, your seedling will damp off and die. And this whole process doesn't take very long in very young seedlings. Um, it's a soil dwelling water mold that infects the root cap of the plant. Um, so again, this really prefers cool, wet conditions. These are the sporangia. Similar to the sporangia that we saw in downy mildew, these uh, produced the swimming asexual spores that can move through the water. So part of my research um, is determining whether we can control soil-borne pathogens via seed treatments. The objective of this work was to determine if current fungicide seed treatments available improve germination and seedling viability on both uninoculated or inoculated seeds uh, with Pythium muriatilum. And we also included Pythium ultimum, another species of um, Pythium that causes damping off. Here I tested three different fungicide seed treatments. Um, there was Americop, which is a copper hydroxide product, um, ProBioUltum, pro uh, which I'll refer to as PBU, uh, is another copper hydroxide product, um, and then a phosphite product, Prudent 44 and neutral. And uh, here we use the hemp cultivar Vega, which, and these seeds were all treated here at Cornell. Um, in this experiment, I sowed the seeds directly into these styrofoam trays, which were then placed in a basin of water where the Pythium inoculum was directly added. So this system was used so that we could ensure Pythium infection. Like I said, this really needs a wet environment um, to survive. So by adding the inoculum into this water, we were able to get a heavy infection. And then, so we had uh, flats that were inoculated with Pythium muriatilum, Pythium ultimum, or that were left not inoculated. And all of the different seed treatments were included in each of the inoculum sources. Uh, for 22 days, the number of germinated seeds, seedlings which died post-emergence were damped off, and the number of healthy seeds were recorded. Um, here are two flats at the end of this experiment. Here on the left, is a flat that was inoculated with Pythium ultimum. We can see uh, drastically reduced root development um, and a lot of dead necrotic tissue uh, in the shoots. Whereas compared to the uninoculated flat, there's extensive root growth and healthy green seedlings growing. These two graphs um, show the percentage of healthy seedlings. Here on the left, we're looking at 13 days post inoculation. Um, on the y-axis is just the percentage of healthy seedlings. And then here are bars for the three different um, inoculum types. So the first two are the two species of Pythium, plants inoculated with those, and then our non-inoculated flats. Uh, 13 days post-inoculation, we didn't see any statistical differences between these treatments. However, uh, after 22 days, uh, we did see a significantly reduced number percentage of healthy seedlings in our Pythium inoculated treatments compared to the non-inoculated control. So that's good. That shows that our inoculation strategies worked. 
And then when we look at the seed treatment data, um, here each panel represents one of the three different uh, inoculum sources. So these first two are our two species of Pythium. And then this on the right is our non-inoculated group. Um, and then across the x-axis here are the different uh, fungicide seed treatments. On the y-axis is the percentage of healthy seedlings. Um, so as represented by the NS notation here, not significant. There were no significant differences um, in any of the seed treatments compared to the control. So none of these seed treatments statistically uh, significantly improved the percentage of healthy seedlings at 13 days post inoculation. When we jump ahead to 22 days post inoculation, we see that the uninoculated uh, groups remain much higher uh, than those inoculated. But again, we don't see any significant differences when we compare the untreated to those treated with the fungicides. We do, however, see some numerical differences um, where Americop and the PBU film coats, uh, numerically at least, improved some uh, healthy seedling rates. So in summary here, both species of Pythium that we inoculated with reduced the number of healthy seedlings uh, through damping off. None of the seed treatments tested significantly increased the percentage of healthy seedlings. However, like I mentioned, Americop and uh, PBU uh, did numerically increase the number of healthy seedlings. Um, these products will further be evaluated in other environmental conditions in the field. Um, here we, like I showed, these were in very wet soils. It'll be interesting to see how these products perform in field soils with other soil-borne pathogens um, and natural sources of inoculum. And then some general conclusions and takeaways from this uh, seminar are that, as you're probably guessing by now, hemp is susceptible to a very wide array of pathogens um, of, all, of bacteria, fungi, and oomycetes. Cultural practices are very important. These include things like uh, sanitation, uh, cleaning your farm equipment frequently, um, and any pruning material, increasing airflow, uh, that can uh, prevent leaf wetness from uh, stagnant water sitting on your leaves. Avoid planting in wet soils. Uh, rotate to crops that might be non-hosts of problematic pathogens in your system. And use resistant cultivars if they are available or when they become available. Uh, fungicides available are limited, but the number of registered products is growing. It's uh, just very important to read and follow all labels. Um, on your pesticide products and ensure that the product is approved for use in your location. With that, I would like to thank all of my funding sources um, who funded our lab and all of our work here, uh, New York State Ag and Markets, Empire State Development Corporation, um, and all of our collaborators here at Cornell. And I would be happy to answer some of the questions in the Q&A box now. Yeah, thank you so much, Patrick. Yeah, please feel free to open that box and go yeah. through all the questions. So the first question here is, why was there not great correlation in variety susceptibility at the two powdery mildew testing locations? Um, so these were slightly in different, slightly different environments. Um, the varieties that were more susceptible in one location were generally more susceptible in the other location. They didn't necessarily line up in the exact order, but for example, First Light 58 that had very low um, powdery mildew infection in one location also had very low infection in uh, the other location. Even if it wasn't number one, um, they still generally lined up. But environmental conditions can always impact some of those we see. Um, have there been any studies performed that track the efficacy of applying beneficial microbials gen generated from actively aerated compost teas applied to foliar surfaces as a preventative for various pathogens? Um, there's a lot of work currently happening um, with microbial uh, additives. Um, I'm not so sure about examples of using compost teas um, 
as preventives for pathogens. However, um, some of the products we tested are biofungicides, um, which can control, I, I showed some efficacy data for biofungicides controlling powdery mildew, and we're also testing those for um, septoria control as well. So there are a lot of biological products. Um, some of my upcoming work will be testing uh, beneficial microbials as well. Um, I think a lot of that research is currently in the works. Are there any known instances with utilizing biopesticides or beneficial microbes that may cause end products to fail compliance testing for total yeast and mold or mycotoxins? That's a very interesting question. Um, so the short answer is uh, a lot of that isn't known. Um, there's uh, projects that are taking place very soon. Uh, my lab is going to be completing some work, um, seeing the longevity of microbial products in the inflorescences and leaves. Um, and I believe that legislation is still working out some of the thresholds of um, what is compliant when using some of those microbial products. Um, so if you're concerned about that, um, you can apply them earlier in the season um, and follow any post-harvest interval recommendations that the, that the label might give you. But yeah, a lot more of that information will be coming uh, in the future. And someone said, speaking of sanitation, how did I clean seeds for these studies? Um, yeah, so on the seed treatment slide, I think I had in the bullet point that the seeds were cleaned and sized. Um, this essentially referred to that the seeds were sifted through the sieve to give us a certain size seed. So anything that was below a certain threshold wasn't being included. Um, in these studies, the seedlings weren't sterilized prior. Um, if you're worried about contaminated uh, seed lots, sometimes you can do uh, heat treatments or uh, short soaks in diluted bleach and then rinse your seeds well, um, but that's not always necessary. Are there any studies focusing on additional powdery mildew species other than those mentioned? In the literature, I have seen both Golovinomyces ambrosiae and Golovinomyces spadicius reported, and at times, have seen these species synonymized through fungal taxonomy databases, do not come to a consensus at this matter. Yes. So um, I actually eliminated that from the slide for the sake of simplicity. But so um, Ali Kala was the student who completed a lot of this work. When she first started her, uh, her PhD work, uh, the hemp powdery mildew was characterized as Golovinomyces spadicius. And that's where she saw the reports of this powdery mildew infecting other um, plant hosts as well, so the okra and sunflowers. And that's what sparked the interest in that host range study. Um, then taxonomists, mycologi mycologists have uh, reclassified this uh, clade of Golovinomyces spadicius to ambrosiae. Um, so everything that we studied was originally classified as spadicius and then later grouped into ambrosiae. Um, so I believe that ambrosia is just the updated term for that. My or, uh, taxonomists are always arguing and things are ever changing. So I certainly understand the uh, confusion and questions there. And that is the last of the questions I have in the Q&A box. Um, if there's anything else, I would be happy to answer. But otherwise, I greatly appreciate all of you coming to this talk and hope that was helpful for you. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was a great presentation. Um, and thank you, Larry, and all of you guys for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, please join us in two weeks, April 19th, for our seventh webinar focused on hemp harvest by Stephen Philpott from Chicago State University. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.